This is so cool. Hi. Hi. Hi, Dan. <laughs> this is so amazing. I came to the store when I was 22, and I remember walking in and thinking, I wonder if I'll ever have a book on these shelves. It's really remarkable to stand here, and thank you so much to everybody for coming. Um, this is a beautiful audience, <laughs> even the humans. <laughs> Give you a little love. Um, but I'm here to talk to you tonight about my soulmate, who was a very handsome redhead. Um, he was very friendly. He was nice to everybody he met. Um, he was always happy to see me. He drank out of the toilet every now and then. <laughs> he was my golden retriever, Bunker Hill. Um, he was the love of my life, and he saved my life. And um, I've been writing for a long time, and this is the story that I absolutely had to tell. Um, because... It starts when I lived here in New York. I was 22 years old. I moved here right after college um, because that's what I thought writers did. <laughs> Isn't that cute? <laughs> and, um, and I didn't have a job. I didn't have a boyfriend. Well, no, I, I did have a boyfriend. <laughs> didn't have a job. I didn't have an apartment. I had a boyfriend. Um, <laughs> do it the other way around if you're going to do it have a job and an apartment first. But I moved here, nonetheless. And um, I grew up in Ohio. I went to college in Ohio. And I didn't want to be a Midwesterner. I wanted to be a big city girl. I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to um, take the city by storm. And I moved here. Um, and things were going OK. I got an apartment. I got a job. Um, but. Pretty quickly, I broke up with my boyfriend, and things weren't going so well. But the problem there wasn't just that. It was that I had a really intense habit of really negative thinking. Um, thinking that when I walked into a room, everybody turned and thought, ugh. Or thinking that I was dumb, or that I was unlikable. Um, and the source of that, which may or may not be important, but it was, the source of it was a sibling relationship that was really, really difficult. When I was growing up, um, my brother, my older brother, um, told me every day that I was worthless and that nobody liked me and I was stupid and I was ugly and I didn't know that that wasn't normal. Well, maybe it is normal. <laughs> For anybody who has a sibling, it may be normal, but what wasn't normal was the physical abuse because he, um, he was six foot four by age 13, and he was really angry for reasons that are his alone. Um, but he uh, threw me against walls and, and kicked me and punched me, and um, I grew out of that thinking, well, I must be very worthless. Um, and so when I was living here in Manhattan, I'm living with this mind that I don't know is a, is a really troubled mind. Um, and I'm working. I've been here eight or nine months. And then one day I walked home from work, and I was thinking, just jump on the third rail. This was 1996. I didn't know what depression was. I mean, I knew what suicide was, but I didn't know what, how dangerous my situation was. Um, I thought, jump in front of the bus. It'll be easy, it'll be fast, and you won't have to feel this way anymore. But I went home to my apartment, and my roommate had, had moved out, so it was just me, and I put a pot of water to boil on the stove. And I thought, I give up. I can't do this. And I lied down on the floor, and I was gone. And I guess you could say I was asleep, but I woke up to the apartment completely filled with smoke. And the water had boiled down, and the pot was crackling. I was aware enough to turn off the stove, and I fell back to sleep. I was on the floor for almost two days. And when I woke up and realized I needed help, I realized in the back of my, I could hear, I was, I was over here, and I could hear that I was sobbing. 
the sorrow had taken over. So I crawled to the phone. I knew I needed help. I crawled to the phone. I called my mom, and she said, stay where you are. I'm getting in the car. I'll be there in nine hours. You're coming home. And she took me home. She came. She <laughs> took all my furniture that I had gotten on the sidewalk out back out to the sidewalk. <laughs> you New Yorkers know about that. Um, and she took me home, which saved my life. But it was also another sign of my failure. I had failed at life in the city. And you know, my first effort at being a, an adult was a failure. And I sank even further. I sank uh, so far that um, one day my dad came home from work and I'd been on the couch for 10 days and he said, you have to get up. You have to go outside. And I said, no, I can't. This is my only place left. He forced me to get up and I went and I walked down the street and I felt a little better, but it didn't really help. They got me to psychiatrists. They got me to therapists. They did all the right things. But when I was a little girl, the one thing that helped me feel better was taking the dog into my room because the dog didn't have an opinion about me. The dog didn't think I was stupid. The dog loved me. The dog thought I was fantastic. The dog loved the attention. And I needed it so desperately. I needed so desperately to be confident that I was liked. Um, so I said to my mom, it was the first hopeful thing I'd said in months. I said, you know what I think might help? I think getting a dog might help. She said, OK. <laughs> yes. I had gone to the bookstore. I'd gotten two books. I got Prozac Nation. <laughs> and I got Your Guide to Your New Puppy. And I researched breeds, and I decided that I wanted a golden retriever. And so my mom, being the you know dutiful mother, incredible woman that she is, got out the newspaper, because it was 1996. There was no internet. And she found litters of puppies that were available, goldens. And we got in the car and we drove out and we found, we went to the first litter and there were adorable white little fluffy things and they were running all over the place. But they ran away from us. So of course I felt rejected. So I said this, my dog is not here. We went to the next litter. My mom and I drove up. We were out in a rural town in Ohio called Alexandria. I got out of the car. My mom started talking to the breeder. I sat, or I, I went and stood over by the house and there were no dogs there was one dog in sight and the breeder said oh hold on a second and she whistled really loud <laughs> and all these dogs came out of the woods <laughs> it was the coolest thing ever and I thought this is a good start um, and I stood there by myself for a while just sort of observing this beautiful sight and this little puppy there were three left and this little puppy saw me he walked over to me he sat down right at my feet and he looked up at me as if he was saying, there you are. I've been waiting for you. I found you. <laughs> um, so I took him home, and I was terrified. I was terrified. I thought, what am I doing? I don't have a job. I don't have a city. I don't know what I'm going to do next. But every time I pet this dog, I came right back down to earth, out of my thoughts, out of this up here, back into this moment this beautiful creature who was going to, who was already devoted to me, who had already fallen asleep in my lap on the way home. Um, and so I took him home and I named him Bunker Hill. And his name is Bunker Hill because my parents' first dog was named Bunker Hill. And I wanted to, to give an homage to them about how much they had helped me. And I also went and looked at the encyclopedias that we had, because, you know, 1996. And I went in those gold, remember those gold encyclopedias that we used for our, <laughs> went and I looked up the Battle of Bunker Hill. And the Battle of Bunker Hill was a battle in the Revolutionary War where the colonials lost to the British, but they didn't lose really bad. <laughs> they only lost a little, and they, they felt like potentially after this battle, they'd lost the battle, but they thought maybe they could win the war. And I thought, if that's not a perfect metaphor name for this creature who's come into my life, I don't know what is. Um, and so I had him for a few days. 
I had him for a few weeks and it was wonderful. He was a beautiful distraction. A puppy is the best distraction on a bad day. But the depression was not like a virus that passed. It's an illness that I have had my whole life and I, I work on it and I fight. I don't actually fight it. I turn to it and I listen to it and I say, hi, you're back, what's up? Um, but it, it felt like it was going away and I'd had him for a few weeks and suddenly, not suddenly, I started to feel down again, really down, like black down. And I thought, what, <laughs> just getting a dog can't help me. What am I doing? I sat on my parents' couch, I put my head in my hands, I started, see? <laughs> yeah, they know. <laughs> it gets better, it gets better. <laughs> It does, it does, it gets so much better. You can, yeah. So, um, so, so I sat on the couch, I was crying, my head was in my hands, and the dog, my dog was sitting across the living room, and he noticed, he noticed my sorrow, and he walked over to me, and he sat on my feet, and he leaned against my shins, and I pulled my hands away from my face, and I went, did he just see this? And I thought, and it was like he looked at me like this, you know, sort of like goofy side thing with his tongue hanging out. And it was like, he was like, is, this, is that better? Did that help? And I thought, I'm either going crazy, really, or this dog is sensitive to me and to my moods and to my needs, and he can help me. And I can decide to believe the first thing or the second thing. And so I decided to believe the second thing. And he did it his whole life. His whole life, he was my companion um, in my sorrow and in my joy um, and for other people as well. And so I thought, <coughs> um, well, maybe I'll do the video. Well, so let me do this next part first. So I thought after he died, he died in 2007, and I thought I could write about him but I can't write about how dependent I was on my dog. I can't write about how much I needed him and how much he meant to me because people will be like, okay. <laughs> That's a cute story. It's not a cute story, it's, it was my lifeline. Um, and I had been writing for a long time, but the day after Bunker died, um, I was pregnant with my second daughter. Um, I had I'd submitted something to a contest but forgotten about it, and the day after he died, I found out that I was a finalist in this really prestigious writing contest. And I wasn't as happy about that as I was about the fact that this felt like a tap from Bunker. I'd lost him less than 24 hours before, and he was saying, tell our story. Tell our story. And I thought, well, okay, I will, but I don't have to show it to anybody. <laughs> well, apparently I showed it <laughs> to some people. <laughs> So um, now we're going to do, I'm going to do a little bit of a reading, and I don't read much, I just read a little, and then you get to see the beautiful boy. If you guys can't see over there, it's probably okay to stand up, right? So the video's here. Do I start it? Yeah. Oh, look at how fancy. Okay. Ah, all right. Bunker had a lot to learn. He was mellow for a puppy, but he tugged on the leash, chewed everything in sight, and didn't exactly come when called. The dog training book said that dogs who know they're not in charge are relaxed and happy, and their work is only to follow and obey. A dog that is led to believe he's the alpha dog will act out and can become anxious and even aggressive because he's under the illusion that taking care of the pack is his responsibility. I wanted Bunker to know that I was the boss, so I took him outside for some training that would help him see me as his pack leader. <laughs> <coughs> Out in the yard with a 15-foot leash, I followed the book's instructions to walk quietly in a square as big as the yard would allow. I was to hold the leash with two hands at my chest, pay no attention to Bunker, stop at the corners, and just walk in one big cornered loop. <laughs> I would use no voice commands and never yank on the leash, just keep walking. And if he fell, I would slow down so he could right himself. But otherwise, I was just to walk. <laughs> the idea was that he would learn slowly to stay by my side. I was the alpha. 
I felt enormously capable of being in charge and taking care of this precious dog. And when I began walking, Bunker was like a housefly on the end of a fishing line, darting in every direction. Instructions for the lesson included avoiding eye contact, but watching peripherally. He spotted a squirrel and raced into the woods after it and then hit the end of the leash, his back feet flipping under his soft puppy body. A bird hopped through beds of leaves at the edge of the woods and Bunker lunged toward it, tripped and got dragged a few feet. I slowed to let him catch up, but I didn't acknowledge him. I paused, could feel that he'd righted himself and had begun to walk again, so I sped up. <laughs> Sometimes he disappeared from my line of sight completely and I had to trust that he was walking and okay until I felt a pull on the leash. My mom thought the sight of me dragging my puppy around the yard was funny, so she grabbed the video camera and hid behind a bush, laughing and filming. And Bunker caught her scent and he pulled toward her as I walked in the opposite direction. This resulted in another wipeout and a three foot dragging through the grass. If my mom thought I'd finally truly lost my mind, she knew not to say so. She just laughed as I walked, stopped, turned, walked, stopped, turned, and this poor little puppy tried to keep up. I laughed too at first, but after several rotations, the slow walk became like a meditation. With each turn, I began to realize that Bunker and I were becoming a pack of two. He was learning to trust and follow me, and I was learning that I could lead confidently. And when I felt him dragging at the end of the lead, I was terrified I might hurt him, but I began to understand the lesson we were learning. If we were attentive to each other, we would both be okay. Within about 10 minutes, Bunker understood. He trotted at my side, looking up at me to see which way my eyes were turned. He'd figured out that I looked in the direction I was going to go next. His puppy paws lumbered. <laughs> I almost fall down to keep up with me, but he stayed by my side. He wasn't tugging at all now, not getting distracted, and I could feel that he was happy to follow me, relieved even. <laughs> When we came inside, he collapsed on the floor with fatigue, and I carried him to my room and put him in his crate. I lay on the bed next to him and felt myself drifting off as well. And as he fell asleep, he opened his eyes at the slightest noise to make sure I was still close by. Don't worry, buddy, I said. I'm right here. I'll always be right here. And at that, we both fell into a deep sleep. Wasn't he the cutest thing ever, 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 ever? Um, so I'm not gonna tell you too much more about the story. I don't know how many people have read it, but I'm not gonna spoil it, but I'll tell you a little bit more. So um, after I'm at home for a little while and I get bunker and I'm feeling better, I'm feeling stable for the most part, I get a phone call from an old friend I hadn't heard from in a long time and she said, I'm moving into a house in Seattle with these two guys and we're gonna get a dog. And I was like, really? <laughs> and she said, wait, where are you gonna move next? And I said, well, I don't know, but I have a dog and I'm looking for some place to go. And so I moved out there. Um, and I was really worried because I didn't know if I would be okay in another city, it could be another failure. And it was fantastic. But um, at eight months old, Bunker started to have some episodes where he would fall um, really, you know, his back legs would completely collapse under him and he would scream this unearthly sound. And I took him to the vet and the vet said, this is the worst uh, hip mor malformation I've ever seen, you need to put him down. And I said, uh, nope, <laughs> no. And so I had to try to do what I could to save his life. Um, and so we saved each other. He saved me from me, and I think that in a way, he chose me because he knew I would never give up on him. Um, and he lived to be 11, and the day after, well, the day he died, my daughter came home from preschool. She was two years old. Um, and she had started to have some bad dreams, and he knew the way he always knew, and he'd started to sleep in her room on her floor and I'd noticed a spot of blood on the floor, <coughs> and
and I took him to the vet and uh, he didn't make it much longer than that. He lived 10 more days. And the day he died, my daughter was in preschool. And she came home from school and we said, Bunker went to heaven. And she said, well, who's gonna protect me from the monsters? And I thought, that's the same exact thought I have. But I said to her, Daddy and I will protect you, honey, every day of your life. And, um, you know, in a way, my parents did the same thing for me. You know, my parents failed me in that they didn't help with my brother, and they saved my life. And writing this book was an exploration of family and of devotion. Um, and I wrote as hard and clear as I could about what I know to be true. And it was initially published by a teeny tiny press in Minnesota. Um, it was a mental health imprint. This, this lovely gentleman had a really terrible anxiety disorder and when he was at his lowest, his most suicidal, he thought, if I survive this, I'm gonna do something to help people. And so he started this tiny little publishing company. And we worked on this book together and it came out and the day it came out, it sold out everywhere online. So I called my mom and I said, Mom, did you buy all the books? <laughs> because I wouldn't put it faster. <laughs> and she said, no, honey, I didn't. Um, and I started getting messages, and I thought this risk I was taking about telling the truth of my story and telling the truth of my soulmate and the love of my life um, maybe wasn't such a big risk after all. Maybe I wasn't the only one out there like this. And boy, am I not. <laughs> um, after it was out for a few months, I got this fantastic phone call from my fantastic agent who is here, thank you. And she had an offer from Penguin to get this book into more hands. And I was ecstatic. And um, I've been on the road for three weeks. This is my last reading. Um, I will collapse in 6.2 hours. <laughs> Um, but I wouldn't change it for the world. I've met some incredible people, some people whose lives have been saved by their animals. Not just dogs, cats too. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, uh, I think the message I guess I'll end with before we have questions is just, I'm just really, really grateful. I'm really grateful to be here. I'm grateful that I made it through what I made it through, and I'm so grateful that Bunker ever existed. Um, he was the ring bearer in my wedding. <laughs> he was so cute, he wore a tuxedo. He was so proud of himself. A couple people were here at my wedding, they saw. Um, and, you know, when something that beautiful happens in your life, it's, it's really, it's an honor to, to share it with other people. And I can tell from a lot of your faces that a lot of you've had this similar kind of love. And how beautiful is it? It's fantastic. So.